welcome again. Uh, if you're watching on Zoom and you have any questions, just please use that Q&A box. I appreciate a bunch of you coming in and saying that uh, you could hear me at least uh, through there. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can feel free to use the live chat function as well. Uh, I'll be able to answer your chat questions at the end of the session. Uh, so my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department the last uh, eight years now, uh, traveling around North America, helping techs and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on. Uh, so I had 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Before that, it was eight years as a Subaru technician. So I was a Subaru tech at a dealership and over time, I guess, became the uh, default diagnostic guy in the shop. So, uh, you know, I had all the intermittent problems, the drivability issues, the weird wiring problems that would seem to pop up on those vehicles. That's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all those different issues. And then before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous French and jobs, been about 25 plus years under the hood for me. So our topic today is component testing. We're gonna talk about, I guess maybe a little bit more advanced form of component testing using accessories. So uh, the current probe and a pressure probe uh, to test a fuel injector. And so if you think about testing components on a vehicle, there could be a multitude of ways that we can test them. Uh, so in the case of a fuel injector, we can test them electrically, mechanically, and hydraulically. Uh, so electrically, we're going to use to verify that circuit integrity, right? We're going to make sure that the circuit is actually working and uh, making sure the voltage is flowing through properly. That'll, that'll let us know if we have an open or a short in there. Also verifying the component operation by doing so. Uh, we're going to also be able to check it mechanically by watching the current flow through the component. So in this case, it's a, it's a solenoid. A fuel injector is a solenoid. Uh, so we can view the current flowing through there and then therefore verify the mechanical motion up and down the movement there. And we can also, since there's fluid flowing through here, gasoline in this case, or, well, yeah, in this case, we're looking at a gasoline fuel injector. We could do diesel, but in this case, gasoline. Uh, can view the pressure change and the pressure drop and then verify the state of flow of that gasoline going through there as well. So if we wanted to take a look at all three of them on the screen at the same time, we're going to go through each of these uh, one at a time. But if we look the yellow line here, this yellow line, that is the voltage going through the injector. Uh, so we can see where the PCM grounds it to turn it on and where it releases. You can also see the amperage flowing through. So that's our mechanical workings of the fuel injector. And then we can also see the pressure. So we have pressure here about 35 PSI or so little wiggling up and down. And then we can see when it opens, it drops off a little bit. And then when it closes, we have this extra spike here where the pressure increases slightly uh, at the end there. So first off, let's look at voltage. So we have a battery here and, we, and most conventional uh, gasoline fuel injectors will be provided constant battery voltage. Uh, and also usually the ground side is controlled by a driver inside the computer. Uh, and then here we have a cross section of the fuel injector. So fuel goes in the top, it's a top feed style. So it goes in the top. And then we have this electromagnet coil that's uh, denoted by these tan boxes on either side. Uh, so that will have electricity applied to it and we'll pull up this pintle. This pintle here sits down, uh, here's the bottom of, of the valve. And that's the little seat that it sits on right there. And it will lift this pintle off the seat and allow the injector to then spray fuel. So all around this pintle, this white area here around the outside, that will be full of fuel. And that allows the fuel to spray, so the pressurized fuel. Uh, so if we look, uh, testing this, we'd be back probing at, at one of the wires here, the control side or the power side, either way works. Uh, if we're checking out the control side, we can actually see it making it all the way through. But we should see battery voltage, alternator voltage. Something, uh, something along those lines. So 12, 13, 14 volts, somewhere in there as a constant voltage. Then the PCM will ground it. So we get a ground applied. It energizes that coil, which pulls that pintle up off the seat, allowing it to spray fuel out the bottom, right? So that would be this part of my waveform down here where it pulls it down to ground or applies a ground to that side of the circuit in order to open the fuel injector, right? So it'll go in 
and it'll spray the fuel while it's open. While it's doing that, while that pintle is being held open, um, that coil of wire, that electromagnet is holding onto all that electricity and storing that electricity in there, storing a the voltage. So when the ground is released, all of that stored voltage needs to go somewhere. And that's why when we release the ground down here, we get that spike, right? So all that stored voltage that was in there, and then we get a spike induced back into the line. And that is around a little over 80 volts. So we can see voltage comes in, grounds it, turns it on, releases, and then we have our spike. Now the spike dissipates rapidly. And then we have this other point right here, this bump. They call that, uh, this could be uh, called a pintle bump. Some people call it that. And that is the point where that pintle actually is closing, snapping shut and sealing itself back together. So down here where that pintle comes down and seals back up would be this point right there. So we can actually see the injector close by looking at this. Then if we wanted to check the amperage, same thing as we saw on that screen previous, the amperage and the voltage and the pressure all relate to each other in time. And that's the beauty of being able to look at that using a scope is to see the relationship in time. So once again, we'll apply that ground and we'll see it ramp up. Now, as it's ramping up, this part of the line, you see that dip right there in the middle. Everything that occurs before that dip, that is the, uh, the coil energizing, uh, the amperage flowing through to energize the coil. It also needs to overcome the pressure of that spring, the return spring that pushes it back closed needs to overcome the pressure of that. And it also needs to have the motion, the upward motion of this pintle coming up. So all of that occurs in this spot. Then when we see this little flat spot, that bump, that is the pintle actually opening, leaving the seat. At that point, we have slightly less resistance. So we have slightly less amperage required to go in there. Uh, so we have that. And then it will go up, in this case, it's a current limited injector. So it just limits to a set amount of current. If it wasn't current limited, it would go up and come down like a triangle. <laughs> when the ground is released off the injector driver, it closes. And then since we have no more voltage flowing through the circuit, we have no more amperage and that all dissipates and goes away as well. And then if we wanted to check the pressure, as we saw before, we would check the pressure on the way in. So pressure comes in. And then when the injector opens, uh, in this case, uh, this vehicle didn't have a huge drop in pressure, and I suppose that's normal for this because it's a normally running vehicle, so I guess we're in good shape there. Uh, it's also a return style system, so I think on a return list you see a bit more of a pressure drop there. Uh, but in this case, not a ton of pressure drop. We can see it goes from about 35 down to maybe 33 or so, so you lost a couple PSI there, not, not a big deal. Uh, and But then when the injector closes, though, uh, we see that big spike because when the injector closes, uh, the fuel can then no longer flow through there. And then uh, it, it kind of backs up, it gathers in behind there and backs up a little bit before it can bleed off somewhere else. So we have that little spike sometimes in the pressure, All right? So if we go back, recap again, what we looked at before, there's your electrical right there on the yellow line. There's your mechanical by looking at the amperage flowing through, we can see where the pintle opens, leaves the seat. On the electrical, we can see where the pintle closes, returns to the seat. So if we think about this yellow line, this ground right here, if you want to think about it this way, this is the computer's commanded on time. It's how long it is commanding that injector to be on. That, that, that is that distance here, because that's an output from the computer, right? That's what we're watching, seeing how the computer's outputting it. On this, we can see the actual spray of the of the fuel right so it, it starts spraying right around here where that pintle leaves the seat and then at the same time on the electrical side we can see where the pintle returns to the seat so it commands to spray this long it ends up spraying from here to here so they're offset by a little bit but they're pretty close to about the same and the computer is programmed to know you know what the dis what the time needs to be based on load and, and all that um, so we can just see how they relate. And then, of course, we see how the pressure relates with that as well. So that's how they're all tied together. So we have another example here and a case study. So this is on an O2 Ford Explorer. And the symptom is it's a no start after a PCM was installed. The PCM was installed at a different shop. And then the engine started after it was reset. But a short time later, it would not start again. 
Uh, so when we have a no start, what's the best play, what's best course of action? It could be a, a whole host of things to make that car not start. Uh, so what's the problem? So let's see if we can go through and, and figure it out. So this is an 02, right? So we don't have the full vehicle code scan available. That's pretty much 06 and newer, but we can still go into the module. So we'll go into engine module and see what we have for codes. So we can go into engine powertrain and then we'll go to codes. And then on a Ford, they have a couple ways of looking at codes. We can look at the memory codes. We can look at pending codes. And then they also have two self-tests. They have a key on engine running self-test and a key on engine off self-test. So in this case, it's key on engine off. So we'll do that key on engine off self-test. And it comes back with a bunch of codes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Mm, seven, eight, eight codes on this vehicle. We'll, we'll discount this P1000. That's just the uh, onboard diagnostic system's not complete. All right, so we have that. So a ton of codes and they're all pretty much high input, right? Bank one, high input, circuit one, high input, switch A, high input, high input, high input on all of those. All right, so that is, it is showing us some sort of a voltage problem in the system and they all share a common, uh, common bond there, the 5 volt reference signal. So we'll look at that a little bit later. But first, why is it not starting? We have eight codes. Where do you where do you begin when you have eight codes? So let's start with the basics. What do we need to make this truck start? Well, we need fuel, we need spark, uh, we need air, and we need compression, right? So we need those four those four those those are four ingredients of a running engine. Uh, so easy enough to check for spark. So we checked for spark and it did have spark. So it wasn't really, um, it wasn't an ignition problem, right? So we can rule that out. Why would we check the ignition and the fuel first? Well, because the PCM was installed. So if it was the wrong PCM, uh, that could cause some sort of an issue, I suppose, maybe a cam crank uh, relationship or, or something of that nature. So we're checking the things that the PCM controls, right? So uh, spark controlled by the PCM, fuel, also controlled by the PCM with the fuel injectors, right? Now it could be a, maybe a PATS problem, right? Um, Cause when the PATS cuts it out, the PAT cuts out, PATS cuts out the fuel injectors. Uh, so that's a possibility, I suppose. Uh, but apparently all the parameters have been reset. So let's check for fuel pressure, make sure we have pressure and make sure we have volume in there as well. So they hooked up a pressure gauge and we don't have a video of the actual gauge, but we have a recreation of the gauge right here. And this is what the needle was doing. All right, rapid fluctuations about 30 PSI, high to low, 60 to 30 or so, 60 down to 20. All right, so rapid fluctuations in that. So what would make the pressure drop that drastically as we're starting a vehicle? All right, so let's look at it in a little more detail. So now we know we, we hook up the gauge and we see this rapid fluctuation. Wherein lies the problem? Uh, so if we pull up some information, let's just see what spec is supposed to be. What are we even supposed to have for fuel pressure? Are we going too high and then too low? Or are we maxing out and then going too low? What are we doing? So we go into Shopkey. We can pull up from Shopkey uh, the common specs and procedures. So we can go in here and common specs and scroll down a little bit to our fuel. And then we have fuel pressure specifications right here for the four liter. Go in there, explore. Uh, 60 to 65 PSI, no matter what, key on engine running or key on engine off, should be 60 to 65 PSI on that vehicle. And it is a uh, returnless system on that. All right, so we'll hook up the good old pressure probe there, uh, pressure transducer, and hook it up to check the fuel rail pressure. So here it is, just key on. So this was you know, a couple PSI lingering, I suppose. And then uh, it slowly builds the pressure over oh, only about couple hundred milliseconds, it's not that long, you know, a quarter of a second, it builds the pressure or so. Uh, so then we get up to about that 60 PSI range. And then cranking, we see that it's about 65 to start. And then when it cranks, it drops drastically down to 20 PSI. And then it's not even able to recover much over 40 before it drops again. So we can see this look where it's going back and forth pretty rapidly. And it's not a ton of time passing in between those either. Uh, this is a zoomed out view. We can see how it's going up and down and we have this distance here. You may, if you can observe the times, you may understand what's going on here, but we're going to talk, talk a little bit more in detail, add some more information. So we have this fuel pressure pattern that looks odd. 
So let's analyze it a little bit further in detail. So we said the fuel pressure has a wide fluctuation during cranking. So we had a channel two, so that was on channel one. So we had channel two for cylinder one injector control. So that's gonna give us our electrical or our uh, voltage, right? And then scope channel three is gonna connect with the current probe to give us our mechanical look or using the amperage, the current. Uh, so there's uh, channel two there and there's channel three there. And then we see we can have all three of them on the same screen right there. We got a pressure probe, a voltage probe, and a low amps probe. We expand the view a little bit, raise the height of the window. We can see where our voltage comes in, comes down, just like we were looking at before. You can see how the current ramps up. And then we can see the rapid drop here. It goes from 60 PSI down to 30 PSI. Barely recovers back to 60, then that down to 30. Now, why is it dropping so much? Why are we losing so much pressure? That's a huge drop in pressure. Why are we losing so much? Uh, so if we look at the time, the injector on time, the commanded pulse width here is 250 milliseconds. That's a quarter of a second. That's like an eternity right now. This is like you know, 60, 70 degree day. Uh, shouldn't be seeing 250 milliseconds when we're trying to start. This thing is just dumping fuel into that engine, right? Probably want to change the oil after we're done with this as well. Uh, but that's like, that's very, very high, which is causing that huge pressure drop. Uh, so as we said, injector on times too high, causing that fuel pressure drop. And that's why it won't start because A, it's running way rich, it's flooded, uh, but B, it's, you know, it's just no pressure either. Uh, and there's so many sensor codes. You know, we had intake air temperature and throttle body, et cetera, or throttle position sensor. So they all share five volt reference on there. So let's look at the five volt reference circuit. Now the easiest place uh, under the hood here, it's right on the firewall. It's a DPFE sensor, which is a Delta pressure feedback EGR sensor. So let's take a look, have a little video of them testing this here. So they have a meter hooked up. With it plugged in, we're reading about half a volt. When they unplug it, you get about five volts. That's with it unplugged there. And they plug it back in. Plug it back in there. There we go. And then ha uh, half a volt. And then we get five volts. Right? So it goes from half a volt to five volts back to half a volt. So that is, it, it, it is losing about four and a half volts by being plugged in. And that's supposed to be five volt reference, right? So with it plugged in, losing four and a half volts, that's a huge drop. So that means this thing must be shorting the ground, right? It's pulling that voltage away. Uh, so it looks like the DPFE sensor shorted the reference, five volt reference circuit. And so, so they replaced it, connected it back. They now had five volts across the board. Uh, so after that, let's take a, another look and verify that we don't have this problem anymore. So there's our 60 PSI. There's a little drop, you know, 60 to 50 PSI, but then it recovers pretty quickly back to the 60. That's a good running waveform on this vehicle, right? That's what it should look like. And the pulse width's down to 36 milliseconds, right? Way shorter than it was before. And then of course we check through, double check, scan it again, make sure there aren't any codes present. And sure enough, once everything's cleared, road tested, no codes present, vehicle was able to start. So why wasn't it able to start with that five, uh, because of that five volt reference circuit? Uh, so if we think about it, what happens when I have low voltage on a 5 volt reference circuit. Uh, that means the sensors themselves are not going to, going to be able to provide the correct voltage back to the PCM down the signal wire. So in that case, uh, let's say the coolant temp sensor also shares this circuit. So what's it gonna read? Well, let's say in this case that it pulls the temperature way down, negative 30, negative 40 degrees, that would cause an excessive injector on time for sure. Cause when it's colder out, we need longer pulse width on the injectors to compensate. So they believe that's what happened it is it's shorted. So we didn't have enough voltage coming out of say the coolant temp sensor, the computer based on the information it was being fed, right? Based on the information it was being fed, made the adjustments based on its programming. Well, if I see this many degrees, well, it's gotta be this. And maybe the voltage threshold wasn't low enough for it to cause a code, or maybe it did. Maybe it was one of those codes in there, right? We're, well, we, we won't know for sure. Uh, because it just so happened that that DPFE sensor was shorted and that fixed the problem. So I thought that was kind of a neat use case of that, uh, trying to go back and forth uh, and check 
electrically, mechanically, et cetera. All right, looking at questions so far, let me just clear out the Q&A there from before. Thank you guys on Zoom for letting me know you could hear me earlier. Um, like I said, video's not working. I don't want to stop now uh, with what we had before. So we got all those done. Okay. Uh, also, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to check the live chat here towards the end. So if you have any questions on YouTube, just make sure you put them in the live chat as well. If you're watching on Zoom, make sure you put them in that Q&A box. Now we're going to go live onto the tool. Let me, uh, let me real stop real quick, just so I can pull up my YouTube again, just so I can see that. There we go. Share back over here. Oh, good. And it's... Not muted either. There we go. Making all sorts of noise there. There we go. Cool. All right. Now we're back. We are on our tool. Here's our tool. Okay. So there is a wealth of information inside the guided component test for sure. So if we go into guided component tests in North America, we're going to, first thing we want to look at is some training and classes, right? So uh, first place I'd like to look today is we don't usually look in here, but uh, power user test is a good place to go. If we want to say, take a look, voltage is fairly simple, straightforward, right? Uh, current probe, maybe a little less straightforward because we might not be familiar with that. So we'll go into current probe tests and we'll select the current probe and we'll go to the new style current probe here, the ETA 308 d and go into current ramp testing there. So we have some examples. We could do a fuel pump, uh, parasitic draw, but we'll do fuel injector because that's what we were talking about before, right? So we'll go into fuel injectors. And then there's multiple injector types that we have examples of in here. So first one is the conventional. And that's where what we've been talking about all night is the conventional fuel injector, right? So we'll go in there and it tells us how to hook it up, how to test it, go around the wire on the fuel injector. And then there is our conventional fuel injector waveform for a current ramp. Um, here is just, it, it's, it's a little wider look, right? And, we, and that, that gives us a good example of that pintle hump that we talked about where the pintle leaves the seat right there. And we can see that. So that's conventional. Then we have peak and hold. So peak and hold is a little bit different. So what it does is it, it has a large rise in current at the beginning to get it open and then to hold that open, that hold this injector open, it doesn't need as much amperage to hold it open. So it levels off a little bit lower of an amperage there. So you should see on a peak and hold, you'll see it come up and then flatten out there. And then similar to a peak and hold, we also have pulse width modulated current control. Uh, so that's similar, like I said, so it'll, it'll have a large inrush of current, then it levels off and then it comes down and just modulates the current to keep it open in that case, right? So we can see that as well. So depending on the load, et cetera, uh, we should be able to see something like that. And then on the pulse with modulated volume control, that one's a little bit different as well. Uh, so that looks very similar to that peak and hold, right? We have the big inrush of current and then it levels off uh, considerably down there towards the end. So we have that. All right, so that is current. And then if we wanted to go to pressure probes, uh, we can go into pressure transducer tests. All right, so we have a, like a fuel pressure test, right? So we can see that. And you see where you would hook in. Somewhere you can access the fluid. You don't want to necessarily directly uh, line it up onto that. And then there is an adapter that is necessary for that, uh, for that pressure adapter as well to adapt to the tool. Um, make sure there's no leaks, et cetera. You know, it could cause a fire. That's all bad. Uh, so we don't want to do that. Uh, so just make sure you can hook that up. All right, so that's some generalized information. That's inside the tool. Uh, but we can also do vehicle-specific information, right? So we can go to a BMW 2012. That's what I have connected here. Uh, it's our 328i, our demonstration for you. All right, so in guided component tests, if you're not familiar with what our guided component tests have, uh, it's over 5 million available tests. It goes back to 1981. All right, so we have that availability. So we can go in engine. And then we can go into our fuel system and we'll go look at our fuel injector again. So there's multiple different tests we can do. The basic voltage test is gonna be the signature test here. All right, so that, that gives us our signature look where it comes in at grounds and we have the spikes. We have a few meter 
It's going to set the voltage range where it needs to be, sets the time base where it needs to be. Also in the background, note that we have the connector view as well as what pin is what on each connector. And then it gives us that known good pattern in the background as well. Right, so that is voltage. And then to check mechanically, of course, we use that current ramp. So we go into a current ramp test. It's going to give us that similar look here on our current. So I can't simulate that right on my simulator, but it gives us that very similar look to what we had earlier in the presentation, right? Where it ramps up, we might have that little pentel bump there. If I wanted to do them both together, uh, in my mind, the best thing I would like to try first is to use the signature test. All right, so if we go into signature test, that gives us the voltage and it sets it up for the voltage because everything's going to line up time-wise based on wherever this injector is firing, right? So I can move this around a little bit. Let's take the trigger, move it over here. So that's fairly centered. So if I wanted to add current, my current would come in like this and then my pressure would come in like this as well. So I can do that from this screen. If I go up to the top, open the meter up a bit bigger, come down here on the bottom, I can change to my settings. I can turn on channel two. Let's say channel two, we want to use current. So I'll hit my probe here, go to low amps 20, and then go back. I can change my scale as well if I wanted to, down to maybe a couple amps. I can turn on the filter, get rid of some of that noise. Channel three, if I wanted to add a pressure transducer, I can go down here. Click on that. Let's say it's pressure, 100, 100 PSI. I can have that in there. It's going to ask you to calibrate the probe. Very important to calibrate the probe. So what you want to do is have it where you would say zero is, right? Not connected to anything, not having any pressure uh, applied to it. Right? So we want to have just it, it, it open, not connected to the vehicle, but connected to the scope. In order to do that, we'd hit yes. I don't have one connected right now, so I'll just hit no. And then we'll hit back. And then we have that option as well. We can change the, the PSI range there. So maybe bring it down to like a 10 PSI range. Or actually, in this case, we would want that 50 PSI range, right? Because my, most vehicles is going to be over that, right? So, so we could see it go all the way up to 40, 50 PSI at the top. Uh, so we would be able to see all three of those on the screen at the same time. We can't right now because it's not in the simulator. But we that's how we had it set up earlier, if you remember that, uh, that uh, picture we had with the three. Uh, three things on there. That's how we would set that up. Uh, pretty quick, pretty easy. So uh, with that, that is how we're going to go through and test some of those injector. Uh, that's for a standard gasoline fuel injector. All right. All right. So that is this week. Let's talk next week. Next week, by popular demand, we are bringing back our two weeks of ADOS training. So we have intro to ADOS next week. And then the week after that will be ADOS component testing. So actually component testing um, the, the radars and, and, and such with that. So uh, same time, same place, 6 Eastern, 9 Eastern. Uh, both these sessions will be on Zoom. So if you go to snapon.com slash OT, they'll be on Zoom. We're actually not live streaming it to YouTube next week because we already have a, a copy of that up on YouTube. Uh, so we don't need a duplicate, I suppose. So we're not going to do that. Uh, so you can definitely join us on Zoom, ask your questions. Uh, we like giving you a couple chances to be able to watch these classes live just so you get that interaction. If you have a question that we need to answer, um, definitely um, questions that need to be asked, we can definitely answer them for you is, is the point I'm trying to make there. Uh, so with that, um, hopefully you'll join us next week snapon.com slash OT. I do see a couple questions coming through both on Zoom and on YouTube. So while I'm answering the questions, I'm going to leave you this picture of Al here with the website. So Al on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday gives you new platform training, new customer training. So if you uh, have one of these tools, an Apollo, a Zeus, or a Triton, uh, it's definitely worth your while to attend these trainings. Uh, it goes everything from setting up the tool. Let's set up our Wi-Fi. Let's set up our free Snap-on cloud accounts. We're able to share files and such with our customers. Uh, all the way through on the Zeus and the Triton, they, uh, he gives a uh, good walkthrough of the got a component test functionality as well, as well as a walkthrough of intelligent diagnostics. So the Apollo is about an hour or so, give or take. Uh, and Zeus and Triton are about almost two hours just because it has that extra got a component test component. There's a break in the middle. Uh, 5 p.m., 8 p.m. Central Time, so that's 6 and 9 p.m. Eastern time, which is my time. So 
hopefully you can join us for one or any of these classes. You know, the, the, the more classes we're able to do, the more of you that we can ha have in these classes, the more we'll be able to do in the future. All right. Also, if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, this was recorded live um, and the live chat will not be available after we're done. So you can just definitely leave a comment. If you're watching on YouTube, also make sure you subscribe, hit the little notification button, hit the like, thumbs up, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week. Thank you again for taking the time out of your day. Definitely appreciate it. And uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your week and take care.